Yeah, a quick introduction for those of you that don't know me. My um, name's Derek Hamilton, I'm US Business Development Manager with Azane. Uh, we are the, the US subsidiary of uh, Star Refrigeration. We're based out of the UK and uh, we exist in, in the US to uh, manufacture uh, a range of low charge uh, air cooled ammonia packages. And uh, today we're going to give you a, a bit of an overview of uh, some of the uh, reasons behind um, the, this business. And I want to tell you a, a bit about a case study um, involving a, a job that we're working on in Puerto Rico. Um, so I'll run through that quite quickly and hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end as well. So first of all, um, we had some mention earlier, a lot of discussion really about uh, HFC phase out. Um, but before we address that, there, there's a massive um, challenge facing many parts of the industry and that's uh, the, the impending R22 phase out. Uh, for those of you who were in, in Nashville, for the IIAR conference, uh, you'll have heard me talk a little bit about this um, and about the experience that, that we've had in Europe. Um, what we've found is that there have been a range of approaches um, about how to deal with our 22 phase out, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but, but what is true is that R22 is on its way out. Uh, the EPA have published this timetable that I've got up on the screen. Uh, and what that means is that R22 is going to become more expensive and uh, less attractive as a working fluid for, for many people. So um, looking at this timetable, we're really now in the time when end users need to, to be thinking about how they're going to address this issue and uh, what they're going to do next. So what options do they have? Well, they could do nothing. They, they, the, the 2020 limit is, is the limit when R22 will no longer be manufactured as a, as a new product. So there, was, there will still be some reclaimed R22 available in the market. But we can tell you from our experience and what's ha been happening in Europe the last few years that doing nothing is really, really not an attractive option. We have, uh, there's one particular um, end user in the United Kingdom who's faced with, with the end of the R22 phase out this year and uh, they have a bill of approximately $50 million to bring their facilities up to speed just so that they can comply with the law come the end of this year. So there's a lesson there and uh, it's going to be part of the challenge for us as an industry to educate end users and let them know that, that this is happening. So doing nothing is not, not really an option. Um, there are some options for drop-in replacements. Um, and while it's, it's not really a recommended route to go, there will be some, some facilities where a drop-in replacement might be an interim measure. Uh, we heard earlier that the scrapping of equipment that still has some life left in it is, is not something that's seen as attractive by the accountants. So there may be cases where equipment still has some life left in it and a drop-in replacement can be used. Um, however, there are some technical challenges that come along with that um, and, and you really need to be careful when using drop-ins to ensure that the capacity of the system is what it was before and that your leakage rates don't go through the roof because you forgot that your oil wasn't compatible with, with the new seals or something like that. So there are a whole load of uh, considerations when using drop-ins. Um, there are options for new HFC systems, but I think as we've seen er earlier today in the session this morning, HFCs and especially the high GWP HFCs, really, uh, they're on their way out and it, it would be um, challenging for someone to justify uh, a large investment in an HFC system in today's climate, knowing that the, the, the gases will no, no longer be available in a few years time. So that, that's not going to be a, a good solution for many people. And finally, of course, the natural refrigerant option, and uh, that's what I want to talk to you a bit about today. Um, so there's a couple of things we've been doing. Um, I, I joined Star Refrigeration um, around about 10 years ago, 
um, and I've held various positions before moving over to the US. Um, the, the last few years uh, I've been working on this range of, of air-cooled uh, low-charge ammonia packages um, that we can see up on the screen there. One's a, a direct ammonia package for um, freezer applications and the other is a, is a chiller package for cooling a, a secondary loop. Um, but really the concept with both of those is exactly the same. We've aimed to create something that looks a little bit like the condensing units and chillers that, that people are used to um, that, that use HFC refrigerants. So it doesn't look like the big bad ammonia plant that maybe some people think about. Um, and we've really gone along the line of trying to create a factory built package that can be as complete as possible when it's leaving the factory and that, that allows the installation cost and, and the installation time to be reduced and also helps kind of minimise disruption on site which is really important when you're looking at retrofit applications. Um, so the case study I want to look at today, um, it, it's a, a site in Puerto Rico we've been working with um, and it's actually a dairy facility. Um, now what, what they had is, uh, they do have an aging ammonia plant, uh, but they also have various um, split R22 systems uh, around about the site, and, and it's really, it's been a bit of a haphazard kind of um, piecemeal approach that they've used to, to cope with loads that have been added to their site over time. So what they have um, at the moment, we're looking at uh, the, the blow moulder, um, part of, of the dairy, so they're, they're making bottles for, for their milk pr production, they're making them on site and what we've been working with them to do is to design a, a central chilled water system that will provide cooling for all of the blow moulders, all, all of the blow moulder machines uh, within the dairy and, and also for a number of air handling units which are uh, present in, in those blow moulding uh, parts of the factory. So the, the total duty is around about 190 tonnes and as you can see uh, so the, the targets to supply water at 40 degrees um, although there is, some, uh, there is some leeway in that and, and we have some uh, control strategies to optimise the, the energy efficiency of this system depending on, on which loads are running. Um, but the important thing um, about a, a process application like this dairy is that there are step changes in load and, and one of the things that the customer did look at was, was using a, a standard HFC chiller but what they found when they, when they dug beneath the surface was that that chiller was not going to cope with those step changes in load um, which the, the plant would see. So the, the solution in this case um, was a, an air-cooled Azean chiller package. Uh, this is uh, one of our engineering drawings up on the screen here. Um, as I mentioned before, so it's a fully factory built skid um, that, that uses a gravity-fed plate heat exchanger set up to provide the cooling to the secondary fluid, which in this case is water. Um, this particular package has twin uh, Bitzer screw compressors um, and we've actually we've got a model of, of a similar package uh, on display at the booth here if anyone wants to take a look at it. Um, so it, as I said it's an air cooled chiller and uh, to give us the, the almost 200 tonnes um, this chiller is around about 30 feet long um, but we've got some excellent options for energy efficiency because we've got the twin screw compressor set up we have options to run only one screw compressor when, when the loads are low. Um, here's just a little bit more detail about the, the site itself. Um, th this is some uh, engineering drawings of the, the steelwork which is required uh, in this site. And uh, although we've not finished production of this particular unit, uh, I wanted to show you just a couple of images of um, what a similar unit would look like uh, leaving the factory and the type of installation process that we would see. And uh, really the, the benefit of this type of package is that it can be used in a plug and play manner and that's, that's been very attractive in, in a retrofit application because it means that you can have that, that chiller installed and running within a matter of days without having to disrupt the, the rest of the site. 
So lastly, I'd just like to show you a few of the, the numbers that, that justified this um, investment for the customer. Um, I used a similar slide to this uh, in DC last year at the Atmosphere conference, but I thought it was worth uh, showing it again. Um, what this really highlights is that the, um, the capital cost, uh, which is the blue portion of this graph, uh, the capital cost of the equipment for a chiller such as this is uh, slightly more than, than you would see for a central ammonia plant to do the same kind of duty. Um, but the installation cost um, is greatly reduced because the, the, there's almost, in fact, there is nothing to do on the ammonia side once you get to site. There's only the, the connecting up of the, the secondary circuit. So there's some savings there uh, to be made, which is in the red portion there. And then finally, the, the, the top portion is the, the cost of the machinery room. And while we don't require a machinery room, um, there, there's some cost allowance made there with the green section at the top for the support steam work that's required. So overall, very cost effective versus a pumped ammonia system. We then look at the comparison with the HFC type system. And uh, what we see is that the overall cost of an HFC system is much lower and, and it's not uncommon for us to find a packaged ammonia system being 60 or 70 percent more expensive than an HFC chiller. In this particular case, um, that didn't really matter because the, the HFC chiller was, wasn't really capable of uh, matching the load uh, profile that they had. But anyway, we did take a look at the, the efficiency comparison um, and what we found, I mean, as we know, to, to get technical for a moment, Ammonia is, a, is an excellent refrigerant at high temperature, uh, condensing at high temperature because of its high critical temperature. So for an air-cooled unit, um, especially in a, a location like Puerto Rico, where the ambient temperature doesn't drop much below 75 at any point of the year, um, we, we do see some benefit of, of using ammonia there. And, uh, at, at, the design points we were looking at were typically around about 15% more efficient than uh, an HFC solution to, to do the same job. Um, and what we did is we ran, we ran some numbers, we looked at the, the load profiles and uh, to, to justify the, the, this um, apparent cost difference in, in the capital cost of an HFC system, uh, we calculated that there's a saving of uh, over $41,000 a year I um, missed, missed the dollar sign in the, the slide there, but that's $41,000 a year um, for this chiller uh, savings that we're getting by, by running ammonia instead of HFC. So that, that's uh, all I have to say there. Are there any questions for me? Thank you. Do you see any smaller uh, applications of ammonia chillers than that, like even smaller, like maybe for um, commercial applications? I think there's certainly potential for much smaller applications. Um, I think similar to what we were hearing um, from the CO2 guys earlier, I think we're waiting on the technology becoming available to make that a viable option for us. And by that I mean possibly small <coughs> hermetic or semi-hermetic ammonia machines, that's really what we'd be looking for to, to move to the much smaller um, chillers or, or condensing units for um, really if we're looking to carve a, a real new market for ammonia that isn't currently there, I think we'd really need to reduce the potential for leakage to an absolute minimum. I think that's one of the key things. Hi, yeah. uh, Derek, uh, have you tried uh, magnetic drive? It's not something, uh, John, that, so just to repeat the question, John, John's asked if we've tried uh, any smaller compressors with magnetic drives in order to get a hermetic seal. Um, to answer that, we, we've, not, um, we've not been looking at that as a, as a development right now. We, we know there have been uh, developments in that field, um, and I, again, it's something that, that is a possibility for the future, but not something we're, we're looking at right now. Oh, okay.
Thank you. Do I have a, another question here? What evaporator temperature was your COPs based on? Uh, so we were evaporating, so this was water at 40, so I believe we were evaporating at something like 34, maybe 33 and a half, can't remember exactly. Sorry, that, that's actually suction pressure, so evaporating slightly, slightly above that. Okay, I think that's everyone.